Here's an idea. Public space on the internet is neither public nor a space. Talk amongst yourselves. On the internet, you meet lots of people, you have lots of conversations with strangers, and you end up in spots where it feels like anyone can gain access. So it would be understandable if you thought of the internet as a public place, but is it? Is the internet a public place? Before we talk about publicness, first we should talk about placehood. I imagine and talk about the internet as a set of locations traveled between. I'm willing to bet that you do too. Heck, you, you kind of have to. The thing at the top of your browser is called a location bar. You put in addresses, you go to sites. But even if, say, Instagram is in California, their servers, which are powered by Amazon's virtual private cloud, are in uh, Virginia? It's actually kind of hard to say. And the content that they serve is wherever people are looking at it all over the world. But okay, maybe that's too complicated. What about a smaller website like lowpoint.com, one of my favorite record labels? They're in London, but their site is by Bandcamp, which is in, quote, San Francisco, Montreal, Los Angeles, the Pacific Northwest, Carolina, Pittsburgh, Vermont, the British Isles, and Berlin. They're a California company though, so if I buy a record from Lowpoint via Bandcamp, there's no UK value added tax as long as I'm in the US. And if I'm in the UK, there is tax. So Lowpoint is in the US when I am and in the UK when I am, even though they're literally in the UK. And Bandcamp is in both places and others all the time. So if the internet is a place, it exhibits a placehood unlike physical places. A single internet place can be remarkably different for different people and even the same person at different times and even simultaneously. And going to those internet places is unlike going to physical ones. We can be in more than one internet place at the same time, move between them effortlessly and attach or detach a persistent identity at will. None of those things are so easy when lugging around this big meaty thing. So maybe a dadoy, but we're gonna be explicit. The internet isn't a location. It's a set of technological operations out of which emerge services, products, and even things that do look like actual places. So it's tempting and easy to think of yourself as going to Twitter, Facebook, or low point, being on, in, or at them, like they're a bank branch, library, or whatever the grown up version of a Chuck E. Cheese would be. But really the internet isn't like the library, so much as it's like all of the processes that work so you can take a copy of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child home for two weeks. The internet isn't a place, it's a process that functions like a place. Which brings us from placehood to publicness. If the internet functions like a place, even if it's not one, what kind of place does it function like? A public one? Well, yeah, no. Mm -mm. Lots of internet services, especially social media, are social spaces or gathering spaces, but they aren't public. They aren't vacant or community or government owned and open to all. A vast majority are privately owned. Some people are understandably very sad about this, but insofar as websites and apps are spaces, they're mostly private ones. They're owned by private entities, there are requirements for entry, access can be and often is restricted for all kinds of reasons and sometimes even no reason. These characteristics make a space the exact and categorical opposite of public. Mm, but, and this is a big mm, but, through the mid to late 20th century, there was a kind of lamentation that citizens, especially in the West, became more private and didn't use physical public spaces as they once did to gather and meet other citizens. As a result, one line of thinking goes, democracy actually suffered. Not meeting in public to discuss, demonstrate, and defend meant that we became insular sticks in the meat space civics mud, which is an image I'm just gonna let you sit with for a couple seconds. Arguably, the internet, among other things, changed that. It reintroduced public discussion to the public. The internet is lousy with places to discuss, demonstrate, and defend one's viewpoints. And though those places may be private, they often function like public places. And to say that this can make those places tense 
is a bit of an understatement. The closest physical analog that we have for this public-private tension is the shopping mall. With the growth of consumer and car culture, especially in the US, the shopping mall replaced the town square in some ways. It became a social, commercial, and community center. Except malls are owned by private companies, which leads to some weirdness. In 1968, a small group of people were handing out flyers protesting the Vietnam War draft at the Lloyd Center in Portland, Oregon. The center forced the group off the premises and the group brought suit, saying that their First Amendment rights to free speech were violated. The Supreme Court found that since the mall was privately owned and the group was not prevented from distributing their flyers on nearby public land, no First Amendment rights were actually violated. Source. And again, in 1980, a similar but more complex situation arose in California. A small group collecting signatures for a petition were asked to leave the Prune Yards Center and brought suit. The Supreme Court found in favor of the petitioners, not the mall this time, but only because California's constitution specifically affirms the right to free speech, meaning under the federally held First Amendment, there is no implied right to free speech at a private shopping center. But under California law specifically, there sometimes is. Also source. But uh, okay, great. Case law about malls, got it. But also, who cares? This isn't about the internet, and what if you're not even American? Well, so this stuff is important for two reasons. The first is that, weirdly, malls have paved the way for how we treat free speech online. Just to name one case amongst many, in 2006, the District U.S. Court of Delaware ruled that Google, as a private entity and a non-state actor, is not required to run advertisements submitted by customers and that, in refusing to do so, they don't infringe on any rights. The plaintiff in this particular case claimed that search engines are privately owned public forums, like a shopping mall, and that not running his advertisement constitutes censorship. The court responded thusly. Defendants are private, for-profit companies not subject to constitutional free speech guarantees. And channeling both Lloyd and Pruneyards, the court wrote, the court has routinely rejected the assumption that people who want to express their views in a private facility, such as a shopping center, have the right to do so. Private property does not lose its private character merely because the public is generally invited to use it for a designated purpose. Of course, there are counter arguments. When Google or Facebook or Twitter become so big or common or relied upon and there is no reasonable alternative, what happens? The court may be off base here. They're treating internet processes like locations and comparing the websites of multinational corporations, the use of which is often socially or professionally mandated to shopping malls, singular, static, geographically located, spatially limited physical spaces, which are roughly identical for each user and have meaningful alternatives. But still, the fact remains that in this case and a lot of others like it, US courts consistently rule this way, which is important the world over because for better or worse, the way free speech functions in the US largely determines how it functions online everywhere else. Lots of countries have free speech guarantees, but the United States is particularly broad. Our First Amendment protects unpopular, offensive, and even hateful speech. And the internet collapses the space between, well, space. This is why our case law specifically is important. In 2006, attorney Christopher Wolf said, many see prosecution of internet speech in one country as a futile gesture when the speech can reappear on the internet almost instantaneously hosted by an ISP in the United States. In other words, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to deny the Holocaust, I guess. With recent and controversial European anti-hate speech laws, that may be changing, but another factor is that American culture is often synonymous with popular culture, and therefore, internet culture. Though your country may not, and probably doesn't, provide US-like free speech protection, online norms can create the expectation that they do, or should. For me, I think it's reasonable to have two expectations, and here we're getting into very normative territory. The first is that there are places online that should provide full access to free speech rights. Build a community that respects that norm and say whatever you want, as long as it's legal. Get all the criticism and high-fiving that you want for your edgy, controversial, and uncommon opinions and revel in the civic possibility of the marketplace of ideas. 
Hmm. The second very reasonable expectation is that not every place online is that place. That some online services, like malls, are not and are not required to be a public forum for speech purposes. Pursuant to the editorial, curatorial, or community goals of its owners, platforms may not want to and are neither legally nor morally obliged to publish things they don't like. True, that may seem unjust sometimes. So as a corollary expectation, communities should expect clear, well-communicated and enforceable guidelines, terms of service, standards, whatever you wanna call it. You should expect those guidelines be respected, consistent, proactive, and community focused. Expect as much from one another as you do from the powers that be and know what options exist when those expectations aren't met. The result of unmet expectations shouldn't be surprising. Misunderstandings arise when the two spaces I just described collide on one service and the people running the show provide no clarification as to which they've intended. <clears throat> Inaction is always easier, and often it's even profitable, I mean, preferable. But at best, such an approach is confusing, and at worst, it's cowardly maybe even dangerous. So even if it feels like every internet place should or can be, not everyone is public, and that's okay. What do y'all think? What are the reasonable expectations that we can have concerning person-to-person -person communication in this complex, public, private space that is the internet. Let me know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding No Man's Sky. If you wanna watch that one, you can click here or find a link in the doobly-doo. Hey, also, it's really nice to be back. We had a really great week off. Uh, in case you missed it in the intervening time during last week, I made a post on the subreddit about the upcoming Idea Channel Book Club, the first instance of this thing we're gonna try. Uh, and to start, we're gonna start reading um, Pierre Menard author of The Quixote by Jorge Luis Borges from his Labyrinths collection, um, and I think it's in a couple other collections too. If you're interested in that, uh, we'll put a link in the description so you can check out the nuts and bolts for that. We're gonna have that book club discussion on the subreddit on August 24th, starting in the afternoon uh, Eastern time, and I imagine that it will extend beyond that to the next couple days. I'm super excited, I think it's gonna be really fun, so if you're interested, yeah, links in the place where all the links are. Also very germane to this week's episode and something that wasn't written when I wrote and then we filmed it is uh, this uh, BuzzFeed news piece by Charlie Warzel that is a great read and very sort of uh, related to this conversation about what it means to be, as Twitter has described itself, the free speech wing of the free speech party on the internet. It's a great read, very related, highly recommended. And last but certainly not least, on August 31st in New York City at Union Hall, I am going to be part of an Atlas Obscura live show, which is going to be really fun. If you don't know Atlas, they're a great website that collects oddities from around the world, places that you can go visit and see. They're doing a show about rivals, and I am going to be talking about the history of the rivalry between people and chess playing computers. So if you're in and around New York City on August 31st, you should come hang out. I'll put links also to where you can get tickets, you know, around. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links. I mean, you know where all the links go. And this week's Tweet of the Week is everybody who included us in their top seven fave YouTubers list. It was really awesome and really humbling and very, it was turning red for the for a period of about two days, seeing everybody who included us in such great company. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it really, it made not my day, but it made, you know, two to three of my days. So you're all tops. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these mall rats. It's a schooner!